Okay, so, um, it seems dark in here, I'll let the shut up. So, half-life. When an isotope decays into, transmutates into another substance, how does that work in terms of the nuclei of the sample? In other words, let me, let me rephrase that. Right now, this is all, you know what, let's, let's pick one. Let's pick, pick an isotope. So I'm going to go to table N. What did we pick last week, guys? Did we have a nitrogen or something? Yeah. Pick another one. So I'm going to pick one from table N. Yell it out. Yell it out. Pick one. Anybody. Carbon 14. Carbon 14. Okay. What's the half life of carbon 14? All oh, right. We got to show that video. I'm glad you picked that because I forgot. We'll do that right away here. Uh, what's the half life? 5,000 what? 715 years. 715 years. Okay. So right now, every single green one here is carbon 14. Every 5,715 years, half of these, right, and it's random, half of these will decay into something else. What does it decay into? Let's figure that out. So carbon 14 over 6 yields, uh, someone tell me what type of decay does it undergo? Beta. How do we know that? Who said that? You? How do we know beta? Because under the decay mode, it's like the... B minus, right? Good. Zero, negative one. All right. Who can fill in the missing element there? 14 over 6 yields zero. Oops. Zero, negative one E. That's a beta. Who can fill in the missing elements? Kaylin can. Um, 14 over 7. Good. Okay, so after 5,715 years, half of these nuclei, half of these atoms, will transmutate into a different color, with the analogy, and it would be nitrogen. So after one half-life, there's a one-to-one -one ratio between carbon and nitrogen. After two half-lives, carbon will decrease even more, but nitrogen will increase. So when you look at a half-life graph, you don't have to sketch it, you already have one. When you look at a half-life graph, this is the original sample. This is the carbon-14. If we were to draw a graph for nitrogen, it would be increasing, right? It would be increasing. So as carbon decays, you get more and more nitrogen. That's important to understand. Well, important to understand that this stuff doesn't just disappear. It transmutates into something else. And before I talk more, I'm going to show you the video that I forgot until right now. And uh, then we will do our half-life problems. So someone get the lights, please. something is. For people, we'd ask to see the person. For trees, we count the rings. But how do we know how old a fossil is? Fossils have their own internal clock. Scientists can read it by looking at the ratio of two different types of carbon atoms. Of course, every living thing is made of carbon. Plants grab carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it to form complex organic molecules. Animals get their carbon by eating these plants. But there's more than one form of carbon. Most carbon atoms have six protons and six neutrons. We call this carbon-12. High up in the atmosphere, sometimes cosmic rays hit nitrogen atoms. This creates carbon with six protons and eight neutrons. We call this carbon-14. Carbon-12 and carbon-14 behave alike, but carbon-14 has one unique and important attribute. It's unstable. So once an animal dies, the carbon-14 in its body will start to go away. Every 5,730 years on average, about half of the carbon-14 atoms will decay into nitrogen. This is its half-life. After one half-life, the animal will have about half the amount of carbon-14 it started with. After another half-life, it will have about a quarter. And after another half-life, it will have about an eighth. By contrast, the amount of carbon-12 it has in its body will stay the same. By measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, 
we can measure how many thousands of years have passed. So that, that's the basic with that last sentence there. The carbon-12 stays the same in your body, okay, but the carbon-14 decays over time, so they can figure out the ratio between those two, and that's essentially how they figure out. And it's a rough estimate. It's not exact, um, but it's a, it's a pretty, um, pretty reliable way because of what he said. The carbon-14 will go away, but carbon-12 will not. Since the animal died. Carbon dating works for fossils up to about 60,000 years old. For older fossils, scientists use unstable elements that have much longer half-lives. For Scientific American's Instant Egghead, I'm Michael Moyer. So what's your carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio right now? Should be pretty close to kind of like one-to-one, -one, right? Because you're alive, you're breathing, you're replenishing, right? But when you die, you're not replenishing that carbon-14. Where's carbon-14 come from? Well, where is it? Where's it formed? You showed it right in the beginning. It's not formed down here. Yeah, in the atmosphere, right? So it's an air we breathe, or the air that um, gets into plants and animals, and then we eat those plants. You know, we get it in, in our system different, a couple different ways, but. So that's, that's how it works. You're never gonna be asked that on the regions. I just think it's important to at least see that and have a rough idea of how things are, are uh, um, the ages of, of things are figured out. And it's that ratio between carbon 12, which stays constant, but that carbon 14 has that nice half-life graph. All right, lights please. Okay, so we are now um, not gonna go down the same path as this class Friday. I'm not gonna do the same thing twice, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write a half-life problem on the board. And we're gonna use this as an example, and I will plug in the, uh, the different colors there every time it goes through a half-life, just to help us get a visual of this and the problem, and then we'll do a graph over here too. So I'll kind of do all three. Kind of a little visual with the atoms. I'll show you how to do uh, that chart from that video that I showed you last week, where you have mass, half-life, um, and time. Uh, anyways, if you don't remember, I'll show you, and then we'll do the graph at the same time. So three different ways to learn the same thing. Okay, here we go. Write this down. A 100 gram sample of carbon-14 decays or Give me a second. I'm making this up as I go. Twenty-two thousand eight hundred and sixty years. How many grams of carbon fourteen remain unchanged? show you how to do this. Hundred gram sample of carbon fourteen decays for two twenty two thousand eight hundred sixty years, how many grams of carbon fourteen remain unchanged? So again, like I said, I'm gonna do um, use the magnets here as this question, kind of like as we proceed answering the question, we'll do this, then I'll draw a graph, and then you can see the different ways to kind of understand this stuff. And then we'll do one more quick example, and then we're gonna start solutions. If you do have a worksheet tomorrow, I'll, I'll get that to you. Someone got it written down? Okay, here we go. I want you to set up a chart that looks like this. Mass, time, half-life. how I teach half-life. Some of you will pick this up very quickly. In fact, you'll pick it up right as we are doing it. And some of you will say, I don't need to do the chart. Down the road, once we get more practice in lab, I'm gonna give you worksheets with a lot of these questions on it. Um, once you get good at it, you don't have to show me the chart, but initially I want you to do the chart to help you learn the concept here. All right. 
So here's how we do it. Now, in the lab that we're doing right now, when we graph, and I made this mistake Friday, but today I remembered the mistake. Um, when we graph trial versus heads, I wanted you guys to put a trial zero. And we want a trial zero because that's as if nothing has happened. So let's say a sample of carbon-14 was formed right now, just this instant. Okay, let's say this banana is made of carbon-14. So this banana was just magically formed. Okay, it's not magic, it's chemistry, but I just want to say that. So let's say this is carbon-14. It hasn't started decaying yet. That would be trial zero. So in other words, nothing has happened yet. So we always put a, oops, yeah, we always put zero for time, as if nothing has happened yet. Time has not started. I know that's not practical. Time is always going. But we're going to start these charts off always with zero and zero, right here and right here. Always zero for time, always zero for half-life. It hasn't done anything yet. And in sense, this is carbon-14, and we're relating it to this question. Let's say this banana hasn't decayed yet. What's the mass of the banana? 100 grams, that's what I told you, 100 grams. Now what you would do, you would go to table N and you would look this up. We already did this. You would look up the half-life of carbon-14. It's 5,715 years. What you would do is you would write one. So after one half-life, 5,715 years have passed. How many grams of carbon-14 do we now have after one half-life? Anybody? Louder, Laura. You know. Yeah, you. 50. 50 grams, because that's what half-life means. The time it takes for half of the mass to decay. So. You know what, above this, let's put C14. Squeeze if you can, put C14. Over here, I'm gonna add a column. If you guys can do that. I just thought, I just thought of this, that this might be beneficial. Put uh, nitrogen 14. So, I'll do this in red. This is zero, now this is 50. just so you have a concept of what's happening here. The carbon is now, you're going from 100 grams of carbon and zero grams of nitrogen to 50 and 50. So initially they're gonna be equal. Another half-life passes. So two half-lives go by. How much time has passed? What am I writing inside this box? How much time has passed after two half-lives? Emily, what do you think? Well, you add those two together, right? Add what to? Uh, 5,715 plus 5,715. Very good. You would add 5,715 plus 5,715. Someone tell me what that is. I can do it in my head. I've already done it, but I want someone to tell me. What is that time? Go ahead, Max. 11,400 what? 30. 30 years. Very good. Two half-lives mean 5,715 plus 5,715. Errol, what's the mass of carbon-12, I mean carbon-14 remaining? 25. 25 because half of 50 is 25. Kira, how many grams of nitrogen-14 do we have? 75. 75. Wait, I'm not doing my example. So if we took randomly half of these for the first half-life, right? So I'd have to move half of those. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Uh, seven, and we'll just make this one eight. So initially we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That would be 50 and then 50. So eight and eight of each. After another half-life, so two, four, six, eight, four of them, Four of the carbons, right? Four of these would now, whoops, would now be nitrogen. So now you can see it's a three to one ratio, essentially. That's the concept there, right? So we have one, two, three, four of the carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right? There's there's a 
more, right, three to one, so 75 versus 20. After another half-life, and by the way, this is helping us answer the question. We're not just doing this for fun. We're answering this question. Another half-life passes. So two, or sorry, three half-lives. You know what? I'm going to need another, another row down here. Three half-lives. How much time has passed? Who has a calculator? Who can do that in their head? How much time has passed? Laura? How'd you get that? Very good. We add the half-life every single time, so another 5,000. And that's, say it again, Laura, 17? 145. 145? Uh -huh. Good. 70,145 years. Michaela, what's the mass of carbon-14 remaining now? It went from 100 to 50, 50 to 25. What's, what's the mass? In other words, this is cut in half, this is cut in half. Let's cut it in half one more time. I'll give you a hint. 12 plus 12 is 24, so we're close. 12.5, very good. 12.5 grams, good job. 12.5 grams remains. How much of the nitrogen 14, Brie? That's a harder question. But here, here's the concept. 50 grams decayed, so where'd the 50 go? They went here. 25 grams decayed, where'd they go? Here. 12 and a half grams decayed, where'd they go? Here. 75 plus 12.5. Anybody? Brady or anyone? 87.5. All right, did we answer the question yet? No. We got to go one more half-life. Here's why. Because four half-lives, 5,715, added to 5,715, added to 5,715, added to 5,715, is 22,860. So this last number here, that's when you know to stop filling in your chart when you reach the amount of time the question is asking. Uh, Maddie, what's the mass of carbon-14 remaining? 6.25 grams, and that is the answer to this question, 6.25 grams. And again, we would take two of these away, and we would add two more nitrogen. So notice what's happening, okay? Eventually, it's going to be almost, remember Emily asked this question, almost all nitrogen. We'll get to the point, you can't take half of an atom. Can't do it, right? You can't have half of an atom. So ultimately, it's gonna keep going. I mean, there, think about, this is just an example of 16 atoms. These samples, you know, if this was made of carbon-14, there's trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms here, right? So it would just keep decaying and decaying and decaying. It would eventually really never stop, I guess, until it got to one atom. Um, so 6.25 grams is your final answer to this question. At that point, you still have 6.25 that are unchanged, haven't decayed at all. And if you wanted to fill this in here, we'd have to add 6.25 to that. So that would be, what would that be? 93.75, right? Yes, three, one, yeah, yeah. So do you need to know this for a Regis question? No, I'm not gonna ask you this either, but I'm doing this to show you what's happening in real life. This is transmutating into nitrogen. So nitrogen is gonna increase while carbon decreases. And as far as your graph is concerned, okay, again, it's gonna look like this, where this is gonna be 100, and then halfway down would be 50, and halfway down there would be 25, halfway would be 12 and a half, halfway would be 6.25, and that's all the points where this thing is decaying. And at each point on the x-axis, it would be 5,000, so this would be one half-life, 5,715, 11,430. I'm not going to keep writing. I'm doing that just very quickly because we already talked about that, and our lab is showing us that. 
but that's how the graph translates to the chart. So your mass is always decreasing, time is increasing, and that's how it would line up. So three ways to look at it. Understanding how the atoms are doing it, changing using this equation, answering a region's question, and then also relating it to a half-life graph. This right here, this picture, you don't really need to know for regions, but I think it's really good for you mentally to see that. You do need to know how to write decay equations using table N. You definitely need to know how to do these. We're gonna practice a lot in lab, and you should be able to read and, and identify a half-life graph at this point. Things always take me longer than I expected. So, uh, we're not done. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce solutions. Definitely, I have to. It's on my schedule of things to do, so we gotta do it. Uh, so I'm not gonna give you another problem. Most Regis questions are like this. The other, not as common, we're gonna hit in lab, so I'm not gonna spend any more time talking about it. Uh, I didn't really ask a whole lot of questions today. I hope you guys followed me with this. So I'm gonna race it. We're gonna start talking about solutions, but I'm gonna give you your homework. So here it is. Front and back. So you got a front. Here's the, the paragraph, some questions, answers go on the bottom. Uh, actually, you know what? You're gonna have to put some answers here too. There's room. And then here, read, answers on the bottom. These are all part uh, B and part C questions on the regents. So short answer questions. Just good practice for you to see what, what kind of questions you're gonna see. And I will be after school if you need anything. Oh, and I have to give your take off quiz too. Can't forget the take off quiz. So that was homework. This says nuclear chemistry quiz. It's a quiz, it's mostly multiple choice. And I will caution you. I've been teaching for a little while at this point in my career, and I've noticed when I hand out take home quizzes, the class average on the test or quiz drops dramatically. Most students do better on an in-class quiz than a take-home. Does anybody have a reason as to why? Because to some students that might be like, how is that possible? To me, it makes no sense. When you can look up your answers in your notes, book, reference table, work with each other, I don't care as long as you're learning. I don't want anybody copying as long as you're learning. You should do better on take-home. Why, why do you think kids don't do, do as well? Usually, the take home quizzes are a lot harder than the in class ones. Good point. Mine are not. They're identical. Same difficulty level. Uh, well, but that's a good, that's a good uh, theory. Anybody else have an idea of why students do worse on. You don't want to? Anybody? Laura? They yes. They treat it like a normal homework and they do it like Friday or Wednesday morning before they get here or on the bus or in lab or in study hall or whatever. Don't wait to the last minute, and then don't be that kid who says, oh, multiple choice, that's easy. I don't know why at some point in, in like your schooling career, kids start to think multiple choice are easier than a short answer. They're not, so don't just say, oh, it's just gonna take me no time at all, and just start circling random questions or random answers. Don't do that. Put the effort in. I want you doing well on this, okay? Uh, some of you uh, need you know, some better grades on your, on your quiz, so. Um, and I am after school. Not tomorrow, unfortunately. Well, that's not gonna help you. I am today. <laughs> so if you wanna glance through this and see if there's anything really hard and you wanna see me today, because tomorrow I have to leave uh, a little early. Um, tomorrow is 1.30, so I won't be here after school. So that's that. Um, all right, so let me clear this off. Let's talk about solutions. You need reference tables out. So I'm gonna talk about a reference table you're gonna learn. Learn how to use. Go to table F, which you've already learned about. Go to it anyway. All right. Table F, you should be a pro at at this point. So we're not gonna talk about it, but I'm just gonna bring that to your attention. Solution questions like which are soluble, which are insoluble. Um, be prepared for that on the regions. Table G is the next one we're gonna focus on. Table G. Table G says solubility curves at standard pressure. So before we take a little bit of notes here, just to kind of intro this, 
Let's talk about table G. I'm going to give you a minute. Okay, I will time myself here. I'll give you one minute. Look at table G. Make sense of it. What is it showing? That's all I'm asking. If, if you were to try and figure this out without me teaching it, what does table G show you? What information can you get off of it? Uh, so go ahead. I'll give you one minute. Okay, we'll talk about it. 